my name is Cherie Davis. Um, I am not Erica Smiley, but magically in probably 20 minutes, I will turn into Erica Smiley um, and, and then we will continue on with our programming. Um, I actually work at Rutgers University in the Center for Innovation and Working Organization in the School of Management and Labor Relations. Um, and I co-direct a program called Will Empower, which is Women Innovating Labor and Leadership. So now I'm gonna run down all the other things. I'm also connected to the steering committee of the Advancing Black Strategist Initiative, long time Jobs with Justice family. Uh, and you know, I'm from Georgia, I'm from the South, I'm from Atlanta and uh, it's good to be home uh, and, and, and here at Morehouse College. So we wanna thank everybody. Um, who has put the LRAN program together and all the great folks who have shown up to make it the magic that we need to see. So I actually have the pleasure of bringing you all to one of my, my favorite, who I've only met twice, right? But literally, when I think about Southern, like training strategists, organizing, you know, people you wanna sit in a room with who are gonna make it plain, Ashley is literally the person that I'm like, okay, top of mind, start there. Um, if, how many people in this room have been to the Highlander Center? Uh, we gotta fix that. Um, so I, the first thing I wanna do actually is have Ashley introduce herself, but also please tell people about the Highlander Center and a little bit of the history. Um, and we'll just go from there. Hey y'all. Oh, listen, I know it's the post-lunch-itis and it's hot and y'all walk that hill and all of that, but I'm a missionary Baptist preacher's daughter who drove two hours this morning to come and see you. So we're going to try that one more time. Hello, everyone. That's what I'm talking about. We go together now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I got you. You're in Atlanta. <laughs> I got you. Um, let, let's talk after this. Um, so my name is Ashley Woodard Henderson. My homies call me Ash. I use she, her, her pronouns or any said respectfully and in right relationship. And I'm the first black woman to serve as the co-executive director of the Highlander Research and Education Center. Um, thank you. Um, that's both a, an honor and a privilege and a responsibility and a damn shame that it took damn near 80 years for Highlander to get it together. However, comma, we're here now. Um, and so raise your hand if you've heard of the Highlander. Okay, that's why, okay. We still gotta change how many people have been there, but you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, it's hard to do these things sort of lecture style because I'm used to popular education. Um, that's, that's what Highlander is best known for. Uh, some of y'all might've heard of us because I thought we were the labor school for the AFL-CIO, but it sounds like y'all might be doing some other cool stuff. We're excited to hear about it. Um, we, we are a school, we've been a school since 1932, which would make us 90 years old this year this year. And that's after the state of Tennessee, I mean, you know this, but like the state of Tennessee tried to shut us down because we were working with black and white folks together at a time where that's still a thing that you weren't supposed to do, supposedly. Uh, that's after uh, white supremacists tried to burn our office to the ground in 2019. We are still about the business of training the next generational cohort of the folks that will steward freedom movements all over the South and Appalachia, but also nationally and internationally. Um, and so we do that through helping people become experts in, in methodologies, helping people hone their crafts, doing movement accompaniment support work, and making sure they got money in their pockets, all the kind of work that you need to do to be able to think about how to sustain and support the leadership development of an organizer or an activist, a cultural organizer, a culture bearer, created from the whole life cycle of their involvement. Our goal isn't just to train good fighters or recruiters. Our goal is to train winners so that we don't have to do it anymore. Right, so that's a little bit, we'll get more into the nitty gritty, but that's a little bit about who Highlander is. So one of the things that happened last week, right, is that the AFL-CIO had the convention in Philadelphia, which I was happy to be present for, um, elected the first woman uh, president and uh, elected the first person of color, a black man, uh, secretary treasurer. So this is officially the most diverse top leadership of the labor movement in the AFL-CIO, right? So um, I think that deserves a hand clap. Yeah, you can shout right there. Yes. I will, I will also say that the, the beauty of it is the conversations that we often have in the back of the room were being had on the, on the stage. Um, and we also saw the kind of way that the labor movement looks on the stage 
um, and as well as in the audience. It was a very kind of, it was a very warm environment. One of the things that I heard and I had to stand up for was that we are, we are focusing in on organizing and training more organizers. And I was like, this is great. When we say training more organizers, what does that mean? What, what that mean? <laughs> right. And so I, I want to actually ask you, like when we start thinking about like where the gaps are, what it is that we need to do as it relates to organizing, because we can't do what we did in the past, right? That's not to say that old school organizing, right, isn't effective in some ways, but we know that we have to do something different. We're in a different context. We are openly having conversations about white supremacy and patriarchy and heteropatriarchy and, and making sure that everybody can get free. Um, so when we start talking about like training organizers, you know, what does that make you think about? Well, it's a lot of work and it costs money to do it. And it hasn't always been sexy to give money to people who train people. You know, that's, that's part of the cost. It, it takes a cost. And not only takes a cost to train them, it takes a cost to invest in them the thing that they want to change, right? Um, so that's a part of it. The other thing that it makes me think about is that there's a difference between training someone on how to organize and training someone on how to recruit. I'm gonna say that one more time because y'all didn't hear me. There's a difference between training someone to organize and training someone to recruit. The, the person that I give credit to, uh, I see Cassie Waters in the building, uh, to training me when I worked with Cassie at, at United Campus Workers, uh, was this guy named Jim Branson. Jim Branson, the old union head, Texas State Employees Association. Um, and he, he, as soon as I got hired by CWA, he was like, come down, come down to Texas. You don't know how to organize until you come and train. I was like, bro, what you mean? Like, I'm, I'm, good. I'm a good, smooth 20 something. My mama was a Black Panther. You know, what you mean? I don't, I've been doing this for a minute, Jim. I got, it's like, yes, yeah, in my DNA, I was born to organize. He was like, okay, come on. And he sat me with this 70 year old woman, black woman from Texas in Austin, who was organizing the workers in a, in a state sponsored healthcare facility at a barbecue where they gave out hot dogs and bottled waters like this. And she recruited, had to have been over 150 people in the five hours that I sat with her. And I was like, Oh yeah, man, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. And, and what she did wasn't, you know, tell people that they were gonna get Union Plus benefits, right? She remembered their grandkids' names. We were talking about this at lunch, right? She remembered the things that they had told her kept, her, kept them up at night, right? And she was honest that they maybe couldn't change all of those things overnight but with the power of their collective efforts that they might change some of it and that would make more of those impossible things that were keeping them up at night possible, right? So when I think about organizing training in a 21st century context, what I know as a Southern organizer is it's, it's relational, that organizing is about building power, not just reforming what is. And my dad would say, if we always do what we've always done, we're gonna always get what we always got. So it's not to say that the traditions of our labor unions are not important and sacred, they are, because they've gotten us this far, it's how we've survived. But it is to say that organizing in a 21st century context where we're literally <laughs> joking with the, the IT team that it feels like the last days, it kind of is, where people are not only dealing with intersecting crises, but converging crises and exploding crises, now us just talking to them as workers and attempting to recruit them and rate them on a one to five is not gonna keep them in a room. Ask me how I know, Ashley. Because we've been losing union members, right? I'm not gonna preach you up yet because I want you to sit with what it meant <laughs> that we saw significant dips in not only union jobs, but in union density, right? Over the last three years. So, we know that just doing what we've always done is not gonna be what gets the goods. If we're training people to organize, we need to be teaching them how to build relationships and not just transaction. We need to be teaching them how to build power and not just put platinum band-aids on the problems that workers are facing, how to meet our people where they are and not leave them where we found them and how not to concede any territory. Yeah, so this is one of the moments where I'm thinking about you. You already just said the, the, the ding, ding, ding. tagline of uh, Smiley. Uh, so Erica Smiley and Sarita Gupta, you all saw the book out front. Please buy the uh, book. Buy the book. 
We're going to be teaching the book in our classes. If you know you're going to be teaching in the fall, please make sure that you uh, pick this one up and put it, put it on the syllabus. But the reason why, I'm, and I'll, I'll do this plug before Smiley comes in, but the reason why I say this is because we don't oftentimes have the texts that do uh, what has been done here, which is labor profiles. Um, and one of the things that we know is extremely important that we just heard is that you got to listen. Like you, in order for us to do good organizing, we actually have to know how to listen um, and to hear broader stories and to understand that we shouldn't be listening for the just the connect related to work, but we should be listening for what is the challenge that you're dealing with trying to get to work, what is going on in your community that might, um, you know, impact the way that you are even able to get an income or what have you, what are the things that are barriers? And there's so many ways that when we listen to folks, sit and listen to them, they'll tell us, right? And so in this moment where we're, again, talking about organizing, I'm just going to make sure Smiley wouldn't call me on the stage, right? But in this moment where we're talking about organizing and we're thinking about like um, how we see certain things that are happening. So earlier I was talking with Professor uh, Campbell Lee um, and, and there's an upcoming volume that we have uh, with uh, Vera, where we, it's called A Racial Reckoning in Industrial Relations. And one of the, the um, articles in there, one of the chapters in there focuses on like, well, what do you do when you have like the strike for Black lives? Or what do you do when you have a, a women's march and people are like a day without women, a day without Latinos? Like, like does that show up when we're talking about, um, you know, and so on and so forth, does that show up for us or register for us as labor? And so I'm just interested in the, some of the ways that you're even framing, like when we talk about organized, because you talked about labor, but we know that community-based organizations, worker centers, um, there's so many different ways that people are kind of getting at this elephant. Like, how are, how are you thinking about like, the frame of, of how we kind of go in to talk about labor? This is a critical question. I think I think a couple of things. One, reflecting on 2020, which I wish more of us would, would actually really take significant time to do. Um, how many of y'all feel like you've just been in rapid response mode since like, yeah, no time for summation. <laughs> I think it's like, what are the hell are we supposed to be learning? Um, one of the things I've been taking some time to sum up and thinking about the labor for black lives and the strike for black lives and all the other like lefty factions of the AFL that broke off to do cool things in solidarity with the, the black liberation movement that didn't identify as labor. Um, I wanna be specific about that because there is black labor that was in the streets. Shout out to the Coalition for Black Trade Unions. Shout out to Black Workers for Justice. Shout out to several of the black leadership of, of the Southern Workers Assembly um, who had been in the streets since like Ferguson, you know what I mean? Probably before then, that's just what I meant. Um, that, that what we found, what I found as someone who had been in labor, who is now uh, primarily doing work in the, in the racial justice movement uh, through the movement for Black Lives, I hope start it, um, was that people were using the, the word strike all sorts of ways, right? They'd be like, yeah, man, we need a general strike. And I was like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What do you want people to do? And okay, let, let's say they do. Y'all gonna take care of their kids? Like y'all gonna take, what does that mean? Is there a strat, Jesus be a strategy and not just tactical spaghetti at the wall, hoping that something sticks, right? So I think, I think again, the reason why this, this political and popular education is so important is that we can teach our folks when to pull the trigger on a tactic but it actually would matter, right? So simultaneously, as you've got, you know, social movement folks that are not really familiar with labor tactics and strategies, calling for things that are in a, like adjacent to stuff that labor is doing, but has no connection with. Then on the other hand, you've got, you know, basketball players actually doing a wildcat strike. And labor, some labor, not all, but some labor, labor being like, that wasn't a strike. So then you've got the movement folks being like, well, then shit, what the hell is a strike? They didn't go on the court. They are contractually obligated to work. What does it mean, right? So I think there's some purity politics on both sides and some messy tactical spaghetti at the wall stuff that we've been in the mode of that we should sum up. Um, you know, I think, 
I think if I didn't learn anything from 2010, uh, the one thing that I learned was that what is going to be required to win is a BIPOC, working class, fresh gender led movement that is multi tactical and multi sector, maybe even multi ideological, it might not always be people we agree with. And that if we can make that united front stick and have the stamina to sustain it, we actually could govern ourselves. That's where you shout. I'm gonna say it one more time because you didn't hear me. If we could build and sustain a BIPOC, working class, press gender led, united front that was multi-tactical, multi-sector, maybe even multi-ideological to some degree, we might actually be able to govern ourselves, right? And that would be a win, but if we don't have the win in ourselves to sustain it with our stamina, that's what we lost in 2022 and 2021, is that we had put it all on the playing field in 2020 and folks were out of gas. Rightfully so. Some of us had made it through COVID. Some of us had made it through, you know, the cumulative black death that we had seen in this country, the separation of families at the border, trash ass bosses, and, you know, the rise of, of globalization, multinational, you know, corporations destroying our communities. It's, it's all right to get tired. But if we don't figure out how to build that multi-tactical strategy, we're gonna be in trouble. Um, I feel like, you know, we are, we are in dire straits moving into 2023 and 2024. DeSantis doesn't like us. Let, let me be clear, he definitely doesn't like me, but let, maybe you didn't know he doesn't like you. Right. right. Nikki Haley doesn't like you. Ted Cruz is not your fan. Um, you know, big ups to Joe Biden or whatever, but Joe Biden ain't been really good to you either. Right? I mean, can I tell the truth? You want me to lie to you? Right? So what does it look like for us to have enough power to really be able to play like that? And, and what, to your point, to your question, what tactics will be required? All of them. When my elders and ancestors said by any means necessary, they meant by all the means, right? They meant policy. They meant electoral justice, right? They didn't fight for the vote because they thought that was the only path to freedom. They thought it was a path to freedom, right? Direct action because what's real is there's no way you get the PRO Act without people shutting shit down. Not with this, not with this state, right? You need folks that can do advocacy work. We need people that can do direct service work and mutual aid, right? We need all of those tactics. It doesn't mean you have to do it all. It doesn't mean your union has to do it all. That's why we, that's why it has to be multi-sector. So I think to the question of like, what's up with tactics, we need to be training people in all of them so that we can build that multi-tactical strategy together. And I think that's actually right. The thing that's interesting is that sometimes we spend time telling people that they have to be everything. And, and to a certain extent, when you're everything, it's kind of nothing. Um, but being able to learn how to operate within your strength, being able to know that there are many ways to be a part of these movements. Um, sometimes we actually have to say that because you know there are folks, you know, there's so many ways to be able to come in specifically to the labor movement, right? Like I, I honestly say I come in through black feminism because as far as I know, the black feminists that I was reading were talking about work and labor and people built black women doing it in particular. Um, and so I, the, the labor movement was legible to me because I was like, oh, here's a concrete way to be able to engage in my black women politics. I'm gonna do this, right? But that's not how everybody comes in. People come in, you know, through campaigns, through work, through organizing or what have you, but then sometimes, depending on what you look like, you get stuck in a particular area, concentrated in a particular area, and so we might have some organizers that need to be researchers or need to be, you know, communication folks or need to be doing something else, but we don't always have the mechanism to be able to say there are many ways to bring this things here. So you actually said a thing about governing ourselves. Um, so again, I'm going to come back and hold the book up. Captain's here. That's right. <laughs> Y'all give it up for Erica Smiley. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Welcome, Smiley. Y'all should really give it up right. for Erica Smiley. 
<laughs> Y'all don't even know what Smiley what went happened. through to get here, That's man. That's right. It's all good. We take yeah, we take your time. But this piece around like what it means to be able to govern ourselves, one of the things that is argued in this one book here. You should that, buy that book. <laughs> is that um the one of the ways that we practice democracy is in our union, right? When we have ability to do that, right? And that 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 ability to practice within our unions is something that we need to be spreading outside of that space doing expanded bargaining, it's bargaining around our housing, you know, a number of different ways, innovative ways that we are able to create a crisis and keep the table. So when you think about this governing ourselves, what are some of the examples of like what you see that's happening um, that might be outside of the way that we think about Yeah, I mean, I love this question just because there's so many good examples. You can find them in the book that uh, that's one <laughs> they, they didn't pay me to do that that is true but like it's also a really bonus book um one of the examples to me is workers dignity that came to my mind at first and i know safety franklin's in the building somewhere probably um but uh workers dignity is based in nashville tennessee i think tennessee is the best state in in the states um you can fight me about that later um but i, I promise i'm gonna win um and I'm gonna organize you to believe that Tennessee is also the best thing because I'm a good organizer. Um, workers' dignity, you know, again, it's like who gets left out? You know what I mean? You got these brown workers, you know, some of whom are undocumented who traditional labor would have never talked to, right? They got teenagers building some of those really pretty developments that people are moving into in Nashville, and and like a kid falls off of a you know, one of these skyscrapers that they're building. And then all of a sudden Nashville cared about brown workers, right? Workers' Dignity had for years been building with these communities of folks in hotels, in, you know, these construction trades, et cetera, who nobody else was talking to. They knew each other. They were having, you know, quinceaneras at their center. They were like, they built a radio station so they could always have programming that was reaching their people. And then they won hundreds of thousands of stolen wages and back pay for these people, right? And now I've been organizing with them for years and have been starting to have conversations over the last several years about what it would look like to build black and brown worker power together and what that would mean for the condition, the political conditions of Nashville, not just what would happen in their workplace, but what would happen in their city, right? I think about the Southern Movement Assembly and the Southern Workers Assembly, right? Part of the point of the People's Movement Assembly was to use it as, a, as an experiment to see if we could govern our own selves, right? It's definitely a space where we learn from each other, we get to build relationships, all that important stuff, but it's also a governance tool, right? We ask ourselves three questions. What is the problem? What is our utopian vision across sectors, across geography, across movements? And what, what is the faithful next step that we can take together towards getting to that utopian vision and away from the problem? And this year will be the, the 10th Southern Movement Assembly, so it's been working. The Governance Council is grassroots organizations from all over the South that meet every Monday, every Monday morning at 10 o'clock. So anything that happens in the South, we know there's going to be a call that week where somebody's going to talk about what the hell are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be learning? What, what can we do to be helpful? What did we mess up, right? Like a constant cycle of theory, practice, and summation. Um, and so I think there's a, those are two examples and an infinite number of Southern examples, which is what I know, um, where people are actually practicing, how do we get beyond, it's not just about decentralization or about ownership, that, that's part of it. But the other part is like literally thinking about governance as a practice, a thing that we have to try to do over and over and over again while learning the lessons about how we can continue to increase our capacity to actually practice democracy even when it doesn't feel good. Even when you have to concede a little bit to your comrades when you get stuff wrong, even when you have to be accountable, right? Those things matter even internally. But this is Smiley's jam, that democracy. Thank you, yeah, no, I, first of all, I just so much appreciation for Ash and for Cherie, um, Cherie in particular for stepping in and uh, moving the conversation while I tried to make my way here. And uh, it's always so nice to be in a conversation with, with you all and you in particular, Ash. I, we didn't even really get to, to prep in detail because I just knew we would just be able to flow a little bit. So, uh, so anyway, I just have a lot of appreciation and uh, thank you guys for, 
for sustaining my tardiness. I won't go into the details. Uh, <laughs> Just for a few people, maybe introduce yourself. Right. Uh, so I'm Erica Smiley, and I'm the executive director of Jobs for Justice. And I'm uh, I'm also Southern, originally from. I was going to say we might go to blows over the state. I'm, a, I'm from North Carolina. I'm from you the fight about North state. Carolina all the time. Uh huh. We're right on. We're right on the border, though. Um, but I think that part of what you were just talking about, Ashley, which I think is actually really important, is that I think a lot of people, Southern and everywhere else, have an appetite for what it might mean to govern themselves. And when we think about a collective bargaining agreement, it's just a, a policy for a workplace. There's nothing. It's not that. It's not actually that complicated. It's just a policy in a workplace or in a sector, right? And and what we're saying is that it's been a powerful way to um, practice democracy. There's a reason why unions have been called schools of democracy. And so the the main premise that I try to argue is that, you know, along with Sarita Gupta, who couldn't be here, it's my co-author, the main premise is that we want to apply this amazing thing that working people, everyday people have created over the years. And sure, we've won some law to codify it, but we started it, we practiced it, and then got it protected. We want to apply that to other types of employment relationships. I mean, you think about today, like Apple, Amazon, Starbucks, they weren't really around in 1935 when the Wagner Act was passed, right? Uh, so we want to like expand the collective bargaining to ensure that it meets the needs of the modern worker. And we want to try to expand it to other economic relationships, which I think is in large part of what Ash was beginning to explain in some of the experiments that many people are testing throughout the South. And one of the things I want to really emphasize, because we held LRAN in the Southern region and in Georgia on purpose, and there's a, there's a real theory behind it. So, you know, a lot of people, it's 2022, it's January 6th hearings, and everyone's talking about the elections, and the state's a red state, it's a blue state, it's a purple state, I don't know, right? Like everyone's talking about the electoral map. And that's one map, that's certainly one lens to look at the world and to look at people by who they voted for in the last election. But one of the things that we posit is that if you look at the world through a different lens, if you look at the, at the US at the very least, through the lens of who has access to 20th century forms of democracy, whether that's voting, or collective bargaining, who has access to 20th century mechanisms to get those, who doesn't have access, maybe recently lost them, like in the Great Lakes where the right to work began to move in the last couple of decades, and who long lost access, if they ever had it, to 20th century means of achieving democracy politically and economically. And what I think we find in the Southern region is that those who long lost, if they ever had access, have an appetite and imagination for something far beyond what we've won in the last hundred years. It's not just a new New Deal. It's actually thinking about how we would actualize the Great Reconstruction, the original promise of reconstructing a multiracial democracy in the United States. And so, you know, one of the stories that I like to lift up in the book is actually from West Virginia. Some of you may remember the West Virginia Teachers Walkout 2018. And if you look on the map of the counties of that state, and you look at which counties went out first, it's Wyoming County, Mingo County, I always mess up the last one. Someone should call me out, it's in the book. But if you look at that, that map through the lens of a political red versus blue county, they are the deepest, reddest counties in the state, deep red. So if that's the only lens that you're looking at that, that state, there's no way you would have been able to predict that that would be the vanguard of the 2018 women's actions. There's no way you would even think to invest organizing and, and thinking through like, what would it look like to have a long-term strategy there? And yet the people in those places, those people who are the descendants of the Blair Mountain struggles, people who are the descendants of mine struggles, they had an appetite for democracy. And granted, they didn't necessarily see the political parties and infrastructures giving that to them. They didn't see the, many of the current institutions actually giving that to them, but they were willing to step out and take action and stick their necks out in a way that should let us know that there might be an imagination for something different. And we can see that all throughout the South. We see that in black and brown communities, working class white communities, that there's an appetite for democracy that's different. And this is the, the, the last thing I'll say here, and we'll keep coming back to it, of course, is, is this question of race that actually, when we, when we put it front and center, when we confront race and gender as a central strategy to expanding our collective bargaining power and thus to expand democracy, we win. 
that it's not just a matter of doing it because it's right or morally just, that it is, but it's also a matter of winning. And so if you look at some of the fights most recently, so let's look at say like the Bessemer, Alabama union election, uh, both 2021, and then of course the current one, which is still too close to call in 2022, or the uprisings around Starbucks, the announcement of uh, the Apple Store Union now in, in Maryland, right? And, and I know they've filed in many other places, including here in Georgia. When you look at, and even the big victory, the Amazon victory up in Staten Island, like the thing that motivated some of the most active leaders in those fights, whether it's Chris Smalls or, or Big Mike here down in Bessemer, right? Who but I think you actually said, you know, this is our movement for Black Lives right here on the shop floor, where there are, you know, 85% Black workers out of this multi thousand people plant, the place where they have, you know, the highest amount of off duty police surveillance over workers. They said, well, this is our this is our movement for black lives right here. If you miss that and you just go and talk to Mike and Jennifer and Clint, if you just go and talk to them about wages, I mean, they're mad about wages. But they're really mad about being disrespected. You actually miss the motivating factor that got people into action, just like in Staten Island when they when they very aggressively escorted. Chris Small is off after asking for personal protective equipment, right? As essential workers in this very, you know, and so in, in Derek and many of the others who were up in, in the Staten Island plant, that, that was the motivating factor. What's interesting is that when they went into the other plant in Staten Island, LDJ, where they didn't necessarily center that fight, they lost. And so this is, this is actually a thing that I want to make sure, especially in a, a Southern context where the majority of black people in this country still live, that centering the fight against white supremacy is a strategic choice that leads to winning. It is not simply looking at the community as allies, as solidarity, it is us. And even when you look at the workers who are in the streets today at all these multinational brands that are lit up around the country and frankly around the world in some of these places, that the motivating factor is often more centered in dignity and respect as human beings. And, and the same is true for gender. On the same day, April 1st, 2022, on the same day that the Staten Island workers uh, won the first union election at Amazon, on the other side of the globe, workers in Tamil Nadu, India, women, garment workers, won the first global agreement with a set of multinational brands, including H&M and, and now Gap, right? That, that, and here's the interesting thing about their story. Uh, even though the garment industry in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia is overwhelmingly women, predominantly women, a lot of the union leaders, bless their hearts, were men. And we worked with them. They were great. You know, they were wonderful dudes, bless their hearts. And, and we were, yeah, and we, we fought with, yeah, I did say it twice, didn't I? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, but we worked with them to try to increase wages, to fight for age of floor wage, and we still are. But here's the thing that was interesting. The, the base, the, the women who were in the plants came together and said, you know, this is great, but what we really need is a campaign on gender-based violence because we're, we're losing people. Like our managers are not only harassing us, there, you know, there's the Justice for Jasari campaign, a woman who was, who was assaulted and killed by her manager. And they said, what we really need is a global campaign against gender-based violence. And we want the wages to, don't get it twisted, but we, this is urgent. And they mobilized. And through that campaign, it was the first time they actually got some of these brands to the table. Through a gender justice lens, they were actually able to get these companies to the table. And the agreement, first of its kind, global agreement, not only the Dindigal agreement, is not only enforceable, but it includes some things in it that we would want just, that we've been fighting for for years, just in your average collective bargaining agreement, like preemptive retaliation, that if any, anything happens to any of the leaders of the union, any of the stewards, and any plant, like it's on, the burden of proof is on the company to prove that it wasn't them behind it, right? And so all of this is to say that, you know, at the end of the day, we do want to govern ourselves. It is about democracy, that de and not just like democracy, like big D institution, but, but democracy, small D, like the everyday practices that Tocqueville kind of romanticized, like in, in his book, right? Like, like those types of practices, getting people back into the habit of thinking that they should be able to set standards and then also be about the enforcement of those standards. And that the so what, which is my favorite part, and I feel like Sarita always agitated me on this, the so what, right? It, there is democracy, but even democracy in itself is a process, it's means to an end. The so what is so that all of us can have some aspect of joy, just every day, 
so that we can have, have, have dignity, so that we can have respect, so that we can uh, work to live as opposed to, to live to work. And you know, people talk about this great resignation and um, you know, it's really silly because most of the people, aside from a percentage who, who simply just took early retirement packages that could, a lot of people just left three jobs so that they could just work one. So God forbid they could go to that soccer game or that flute recital or whatever it is. So keeping that centered, I think will help us not only in terms of, of continuing to, to win the hearts of, of the people, but also to develop strategies that actually win. So this is the part where I say, wow, Smiley, like you literally hit every bullet point oh, my bad. in one response. Oh, and, 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 and well, I was late, so they told me I had to try to be like, very, spit it all in. Not very Southern of you. Oh, well, I can spin <laughs> more yarns. Sure, I mean, sure. I got plenty of stories sure, to I mean, tell. I heard there's a book full of stuff. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting, we started off actually talking a little bit. I, I said, you know, I find it interesting that the AFL-CIO is like, yeah, we're about to, we, we got to change the order. And I was literally the one that just got to And I said, the reason why we don't have all these teachers organized is because they're all EDs, right? And so now we're kind of left with a bit of a void. But just in terms of like tying in the, the, the organizing and the people who have the skills to be able to do that work. Um, and even when we talk about the strategies of governing ourselves, we also have to be thinking about how we train and how we do things a little bit differently, right? Um, I, I oftentimes get frustrated um, because I feel like in labor studies, we don't necessarily train okay? um, One of the things I was saying earlier is that the reason why humanities is important is because we have to understand it um, and, and the many things that matter to them and understand that there are certain ways that people come into movement where if it's the right spark, it's a lifetime. Right? Like you're not just in it for the transaction, for the moment, for the whatever. You're in it and it's kind of like a home base for you. Um, and so in terms of making these connections around like addressing the gaps that are there, like doing it differently, like having this strategy to develop a model, and then actually making sure that the practices are widespread, that people have many doors. What are some of the ways? Well, look, I, I'm actually, I'll, I'll respond and I'm going to try to be brief because I actually want to hear some of Ash's examples of this. I feel like the Highlander Center has, has kind of walked the walk for a long time on these issues. But the, the examples that I'll bring are, are this. I think you, that's exactly right. Like when you have people who come into movement as a lifetime struggle, it's a different thing. I remember even um, you know, so I grew up in North Carolina. I'm gonna say that again. I'm North Carolina Tar Hill State, um, and it, yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. You. Okay, I go see North you. Carolina. Okay. Um, and uh, I grew up in Greensboro, and it's funny because, like, as a young person, particularly in high school and going into higher education, you know, everyone was like, "Well, it's it's Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, like that's where it's at," you know, all this kind of stuff. But I grew to learn that actually. When people in my hometown moved, they really moved. It was different. It wasn't just a question of activism and saying all the right things. It was a question of actually like coming in a way to the table that was very uh, much more, I don't know, purposeful, meaningful. And so, you know, in some ways, I'm not surprised that when I really think about my first, the first action I ever took, it was with my uh, church. I was a teenager at St. James Presbyterian. And again, these are, you don't, go to church as a form of activism necessarily. You go to, that's your lifelong, you know, the people in that community, their support. It's a very different orientation. Of course, elements of the civil rights movement were anchored in the church because it's, it's a very different kind of commitment path to walk. And I think that when we uh, look historically at some of the most powerful labor fights in the US, it was a very similar orientation. It was not, you know, you look at the mine worker struggle, you know, people who lived, worked, and died at the plant. You look at, at uh, the, the, uh, the trains, right? The, the APRI, the rent, you know, whatever, the porters. Uh, you know, same thing, right? Like these are people who worked almost uh, uh, 20 hour days, right? These, this is like a, a life, a lifestyle. And, um, you know, I was talking about the great resignation just a second ago, and I often liken it to what 
W.B. Du Bois often refers to, he refers to in Black Reconstruction as the largest strike in American history when half a million formerly enslaved Black people just, just walked off the plantation. They, they left, they just walked off. And uh, these were families. This wasn't an organized strike necessarily. There wasn't, there wasn't necessarily a picket line, there weren't signs. <laughs> there wasn't a chant leader necessarily, not at least not appointed, right? It was maybe rotating, but they left. And it was a very different type of strike, but it was a strike. These are, these are black workers. I, I don't call them slaves. These were formerly enslaved black workers who walked off the plantation. That's, that's what we're seeing now in this so-called great resignation. We're seeing people who historically have been exploited in ways that they thought was just normal, now realizing through the context of the pandemic that it's not normal, that if they're essential to the economy, how is it that I'm being treated this way? I should just go, <laughs> you know, and the right wing has been saying all along, hey, if you don't like it, you should go. Okay, well, I'm gone. I'm out. Right. Harriet Tubman. There was a, there you go, Harriet Tubman. There was a really hilarious quote too. I think, I can't remember if it was the CEO of Exxon or the National Restaurant Association or whatever, like who was actually like countering the conservative messages. Like, you know, oh, well, well with gas prices going up so high, maybe this will bring people back to work. Cause you know, we're all just lazy at home collecting our assists or whatever. And I think it was Saru of the Restaurant Opportunities uh, One Fair Wage campaign was like, you know, well, if, if gas is $5 an hour or $5 a gallon and you're paying us $2.13 an hour, it doesn't really add up, does it, you know, in terms of tip wages. So anyway, I, I mentioned that because uh, even now you see people walking off. It's a, and some people are taking, making, you know, taking very big courageous steps and courageous actions to walk off. And I don't want to like devalue it because the things that people at Amazon and Starbucks and all these different companies are doing is at great risk. I mean, we're talking about their livelihoods, but why are they still doing it? We have to actually pay attention to that motivating factor. And they're telling us something and they're teaching us something. And so in the book, we tried to, we purposely tried to, um, without talking about it, uh, we tried to kind of, I guess, break the third wall, as they might say in theater, like between in, in organizing, you know, historically, there's like, there's organizers and there's leaders and, you know, leaders have followers and organizers, you know, your staff, and you follow the leaders, the organizers have all the strategy ideas and the leaders speak about them, their stories and like, what, what in the world is that, right? <laughs> that's Way to overcomplicate that's a yeah. hot mess. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't know. I mean, that's just, uh, it doesn't make any sense. And so, so we really wanted to lift up the narratives of workers um, in the book, many of whom are, are women, many of whom are women of color, not just because they had powerful stories in terms of how they came to the movement, came to the work, but because they were laying out strategies. I mean, you talked about workers' dignity and winning back wages. Here in Atlanta in 2012, there was a series of school workers, uh, both who worked in the cafeterias and, and whatever around the campus here, as well as bus drivers and even some teachers in charter schools who their the business model for them is that they get laid off every year. And then Mark Butler, at the time Commissioner of Labor, tried to take their unemployment. And these mostly women did not simply say, you know, we want our services back, we want our, our unemployment back, we want our assistance back. They said, no, you owe us back wages. Like, you can either pay us for the year and offer us like, you know, like teachers where we get paid year round, and give us like a decent job, or you're gonna give us that unemployment, that's a part of our wage, that's in the deal. Like every year, the company, Sodexo, whoever it was, Aramarks, they give us this check to get our employment. That's how we get, make it through the summer. And they won, they won $8 million, right? And so I think that, and that's here, 2012 in Atlanta. So there really is something about organizing ourselves, not simply as like trying to, you know, win uh, things from government. We need that, that's part of it but actually seeing ourselves in the driver's seat as decision makers and claiming the capital that we generated. I mean, that's a whole word right there. There's not a whole lot to add. What I would say is like, I mean, I just think, I think to your point, it's like at this point in this year of, you know, our Lord or whatever you believe in our people 2022, we're either doing it we're either not doing these very common sensical things because we don't know any better or because we don't want to right? We don't want to be particularly innovative. We want to, you know, do what we've always done and keep getting what we've always got, et cetera. And we, we, we consolidate our power and sometimes our wealth and sometimes our position 
by making finger painting into rocket science and then being the only people that can explain it. I'm lying. Am I telling the truth? You know, it's like, I think we're in this moment where, and this is true, this has been true definitely in other social movements outside of labor around thinking that like I individually can advocate myself to freedom versus being, and you know, the bosses definitely are taking advantage of that sentiment um, versus organizations being seen as Project South would say as a tool for social transformation, right? Especially coming from pre-majority locals, it's like, it's cool, you don't have to join that union. Everybody gonna get the benefit, right, Cass? Yeah, that's what they tell them. You, why you gotta join the union? If we, if we raise it for the union, we're raising it for everybody. You good? Or, you know, join this professional association. You don't have to be in the union, right? Or you just, we, the president has an open door policy. Just come talk to me, tell me what you need. Girl, I got you individually, right? But we have literal centuries worth of evidence <laughs> that collective action gets the goods. I know that my people remember that. I trust that they do. And I have enough relationship with them to be like, tell me about a time where you and your homies, you and your colleagues made impossible things possible. And they can read me the, they, I mean, you name the sector, I'll tell you a story, right? So we, we've, gotta, we've gotta also then in our own heads inside of our institutions, have the same conversation about what it means for there to be collective action in our institutions, right? If we can't practice it here, then we're definitely not gonna be able to actualize it out in the workplace. Let's just be straight up, right? I also think, and I'm, I'm hearing Miriam Kaba in my head, uh, the great abolitionist, uh, who was saying this in relationship to elections was like, how many times are you gonna tell people this is the most important thing of their life? Right? Once every- Once every two, two years, two to four years, right? Well, that's the same damn thing I'd say about y'all coming to me and knocking on my door, knocking at my house and telling me, you know, I should fight for this raise. That, that's important. Like you just, heard, you just heard an example, that's important. But how many times are you gonna tell me that this, this, this $1 raise is the most important campaign of my life, right? What does it look like to, to not be organizing people just around their fear? I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I think to the, the point that Smiley was making about democ what is democracy, for the sake of what democracy, right? For the sake of, of, of joy and dignity, of, of right, social justice. Justice means righteousness. I was an English major in a past life. I really believe in definition, right? Justice means righteousness. That's all it is. So if we're talking about social justice, we mean we're talking about righteousness between you and me. If we're talking about economic justice, we're talking about righteousness and, and our access to, to capital as long as capital exists, which shouldn't be forever. Let me just be clear about my position. Um, but also about pride, right? I've been I've seen more successful examples of worker organizing winning when it gives people something to be proud of together. You didn't like the Teamsters representative just because he's funny and cool as hell. You like the Teamsters because you know they got lots and lots of examples about shit to be proud of, right? So I, I, think, I think that's part of it And thinking about what we're training people to do is like, fear should not be the only thing that you can utilize in your toolbox to get somebody to join your union, right? Your workers organization. It's gotta be intersectional. You've already heard that. And I also think we've set up some false that, like dichotomies, these weird binaries that don't make sense to anybody but us between symbolism and actual condition change, mm -hmm. right? Like when I think about Amazon, even when I think about UAW fights in Chattanooga, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, when I think about like the, the dumb fake fights that people were in about like, this is just a symbolic thing. They know they're not gonna win that campaign. Mm -hmm. Well, it, but it mattered to the people that it mattered to, right? These, some of these fights, even if they are symbolic, might come with some wins. It doesn't mean there shouldn't be a fight for condition change. But also our fight for condition change, you know, I was taught to not leave any victory on the table, right? So what does it look like to not think about that as an either or, but a both and? And then let's think about Amazon again. Let's talk about Chris. You know, people, people, it's interesting because I, I think there's a phenomenon in movements cross sector right now that, that pushes people into these impossible 
uh, uh, you know, like pedestals that, that then they're only set up to go down from. <laughs> Right. Ask me how I know. Girl, let me buy me a whiskey. I'll tell you all about it. I appreciate you. Right. It's like we're fucking human, man. And that particularly happens to working class, black, brown, otherwise POC, you know, folks, especially if we're queer, if we, we can check off a diversity and equity and inclusion box for you, then it might be my first fucking day. And then you calling me an organizer, but I ain't been trained. You, you pushing me to, you know, lead some committee and I don't, I barely know the, the acronym of your union, right? You pushing me to take up leadership, but you're not invested in my leadership. And then you, we were talking about this at lunch too, is then you put me in a historically white space and expect all of a sudden for my very just presence to make this perfect. It's an impossible situation. And so I raised Chris. Because I think one, he's an amazing human. But the ways that he pushes us to, to challenge our tokenizing interest and pushes us to think about respectability and labor, I think is something that we should be learning about. You know, I, I think there's, there's lots of examples of people getting this right all across the region, all across, the, you know, particularly, I think I know the South is, the, as we said, it's the, the largest geographic region in the United States where the highest concentration of black people live. It's also where some of the highest concentrations of low wage work are. Right? So that we're still here is evidence that we can win because if we couldn't, they would have stumped us out already. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's examples of that, right? It's like, well, people are talking to me about all these impossible things that can never happen in the South in regards to worker organizing. I just did a Google search and found out that, you know, remember, y'all remember I said there was a nationwide drop in, in, member, in labor union membership in 2020? You remember when I said that? I said it was 241,000 workers that dropped out of the labor movement, right? But while that was happening, guess what happened in Georgia? It went up. Guess what happened in Virginia? It went up. Guess what happened? I see you, Virginia. Y'all better shout out to us. And right after like the Janice Court case, all of a sudden the biggest growth in a lot of public sector unions, I remember asking me talking about it. Guess what, happened? Region. guess what happened in Tennessee? Remember I told you it was the greatest city. Oh, okay. So there's only one right answer. Not only did it go up, it went up the most. Oh, okay. You know, now I'm learning a lot about you, Ash, as an English major. I was a math major, so there's another dichotomy. We'll get the into that one later. Here. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. mean, but look at these numbers, right? Georgia yeah. goes up 8.8% yeah. from 194,000 to 211,000. Right. Virginia goes up from 7.3 from 164,000 to 176. And then Tennessee goes up 23.9%, right? right? So don't tell me what I can't do in the South. And, and Du Bois wasn't just like giving you a suggestion that as, as the South goes, so goes the nation. He was telling you a fact. Right, he was telling you a strategic fact. He was telling you a strategic fact. And just to build on this point of unions, Ash, because you're making some really good points, that this question of like the union membership rates going up, that's already significant. The thing that we also have to think about is like, that's union membership as defined, or at least as identified by the Bureau of Labor Statistics or whoever, right? And so, you know, it's even larger when you think about people who are like, I'm a union, right? Period. Like the workers in Bessemer, Alabama, we all think they're a union. They do not show up necessarily in the BLS stats because they haven't yet won their election, right? So like, so this is an important fact, too, because a lot of the times the groups that we consider worker centers like Workers' Dignity or the groups that we even consider just like mass associations like the National Domestic Workers Alliance or, or, or Rock or even some of these new up and coming online groups like coworker.org or whatever. In some countries, they would just be unions. They would register and be unions. We're the ones with the complicated. I love this phrase that you said, turning a finger painting into it. What did you say? And a rocket science, that's fantastic. I'm gonna totally steal that. Right, but like we're, make, we're overcomplicating things. When you think about the number of people in this country right now who think of themselves as union members, and, and not just because they've won a union election, but because they've won, because they never left a victory on the table. Right now, just because I was, this is the last phone call I was on, right? So right now in Bessemer, the big fight that they're beginning to contemplate for the summer is around the heat. So they want some air conditioners. It's that basic. 
And the problem is the managers have told them, you know, the machines, the automated robots, whatever that they use to lift things, they can't withstand it too cold. We got to prioritize that as opposed to you. Meanwhile, since their election, several people have passed away in that plant. They don't talk about that in the news. They don't talk about that. But one person particularly fainted, hit his head and died. And then they carried him out and tried to make it look like they were, you know, he was on an IV or whatever, but all the workers knew he was dead. And then he's off the, and then no one knows, no one, you don't know his name. The company doesn't say anything about it. There's no press release. It's all hush hush, right? That is a fight because if workers win that fight, if workers get something as simple as a fan, they will then know collective action got the goods. And the union, right? Like as a union, they will know, like the people in that plant will know that the union is the one that helped them coming together to, as a part of this union, organize them in a way that they were able to get these fans and prevent themselves from fainting. And not just fainting and not just dying, but as the workers told me, from disappearing off the face of the earth. They never heard another word of these workers before. Sometimes they only knew their first name. Didn't even know where to follow up and send flowers because there's so many people, right? So these are the types of fights. Like I think Ash is, is really saying something important here when we think about whether we're union, some other kind of formation that's organizing workers, that we can't leave victories on the table and we can't throw out like the perfect or throw out the good for the perfect, right? So if the perfect is, you know, winning a union election, winning a contract, we might just be short of that right now. What are, the, what are the victories that we can use to continue building up? And here's the best part, and, and this is like silly, but I gotta say it. Like, I, I would love to argue that this was like my idea. Uh, you know, and I've tried, I've tried to like make it look like it was my idea, but then in a full transparency and accountability, like our ancestors have been doing this for, for a very centuries. long time. This is basic bread and butter organizing. Right. And right. And this is us, right, having to get back to the finger painting as opposed to the rocket science. So I just wanted to make sure we our people that. are already there, y'all. That's the thing. It's like I don't need to have them read Kimberly Crenshaw to understand that they deserve a fan. That's not going that's not your hundred thousand dollar budget line item. Right. Just get the fucking workers a fan. You know what I mean? Like it's it's the basic human rights stuff that I feel like we leave on the table. And I think the 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 period on the sentence for me about why I know those impossible things are possible is because the density, let me just speak about Tennessee. The density was increasing while the state was doing everything in their freaking power to stop it. Everything, I mean, literally everything. There was all sorts of government interference, including the governor and the US Senator saying they would retaliate publicly, saying they would retaliate on Volkswagen. If, the, if UAW won, right? It included Representative Rob, that was former, Bill, former Governor Bill Haslam and former US Senator uh, Bob Corker, both of whom are white supremacists. Re Representative Robin Smith and Bo Watson, who's a current senator, were, are literally in 2022 pushing legislation to ban state financial incentives, incentives for businesses that, uh, that are moving into Tennessee, read Ford, right? in West Tennessee, y'all heard about Mason, right? And about how the white supremacist comptroller basically has taken over a town because he wants to be able to control the, the nearest community <laughs> to where Ford's about to build these electric trucks, F, uh, Ford F-150s, right? Who have to move their water lines through Mason, right? If, if these folks moving to Tennessee don't force their workers to vote by secret ballot in union elections, then they will not receive state incentives, right? Versus universally respected project, right? That was already agreed upon between UAW and Ford, right? So if we can still see membership increasing while white supremacists and multinational corporations and the US government and state government in Tennessee are doing everything in their power to stop us, then don't tell me what we can't do in, this, in these shows. We can make impossible things possible if we decide to work together. So the beautiful thing is that we've had this time all together. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that I've got to cut it. And so what I'm gonna say that I've heard coming through this though, is that there is an important part around not just thinking about how we build power, but how we build trust, right? And that the other piece of it is, is that 
we actually have to do that through a strategy of love. And I say that because my sister, who is now president of uh, Chicago Teachers Union, Stacey Davis Gates, has put it out there that the strategy is love. When we think about Christian calls, the thing that I think about is loving your people enough to show up at the bus stop, um, bring blankets, bringing food, having potlucks, talking to people, engaging, and caring for people. And that that is, you know, that is the strategy. When we love our people to this degree, uh, there's really something that we can do. And so I want to thank both of you all. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank that. you for jumping in, Cherie. Seriously. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. I think we're going into a workshop.